Hey, happy Friday. If you have been in search for a kind of mashup between Goop, yes, the company, and Lakewood by Megan Giddings, do I have good news for you? Because today, as you saw, we are discussing Natural Beauty by Ling Ling Huang. Now, this is the first book in the kind of books I have been teasing this year or interested in that is really an interrogation of modern beauty culture and appearance culture. And it kind of just picks at the idea of how that is interwoven with like the internet and social media culture by mentioning Instagram, but it doesn't really fully, fully interrogate that. However, it is a really complex new nuanced, kind of quick, as the blurb says, razor sharp look at beauty culture, societal standards. It looks at race, it looks at class, and it does it all through a really fast paced, momentous plot. We are thrown in right away with our protagonist as she steps into this company called Holistic. It feels very minimalistic and stripped down to me in the feel of it, also in kind of the culture and what it is exploring in terms of beauty culture. And so I got a very sterile feel from the space itself. However, from the very beginning of the novel, everything feels a little hazy. We are thrown into our protagonist kind of seeking out this job. We kind of go in flashback to her in her restaurant job as she's kind of trying to eat some like cold fries in the back room as this wellness guru of sorts approaches her and recognizes her as a piano prodigy. And we come to find out that our protagonist had spent years at conservatory for piano and we learn about the sacrifices both she and her family made for this study, how she was never fully accepted by her peers there because of her class and her race. Her parents were also pianists from China and had escaped to America before she was born after all of the political upheaval in China. And so there are a lot of layers to this and I really enjoy how it is kind of juxtaposing or in conversation in terms of beauty, both musically and physically or visually, I should say. And not necessarily visual art, but humans as a representation of beauty and what that means and how that has also been clearly influenced and morphed by white supremacy, which the book never names or calls out by name, but is so clearly interrogating. And on terms of the music side, one of the things that our protagonist calls out right away, or maybe not right away, but one of the main things she is exploring is this idea of kind of discordant notes and that you need a little bit of pain to really make a piece sing and to be beautiful. Now keep in mind, though my name is indeed Melody, I am not the musical one in my family. That is my brother. He played for a youth symphony for years. He marched in drum corps. He is currently a band and music teacher. So I am not as versed on the nuances of speaking to the music side of things. But it got me really interested because also while I was reading this, I went to a conversation with Julia Fine about her new book, Madalena and the Dark, which the conversation conversation was before the official release by one day. So while I bought the book, I had not yet read it or had not yet read it during that conversation. But she was talking about how music played a role in that book and how she attempted to shape the book around the idea of music and the movements of music and where that works and where it doesn't translate to the written word. And it made me very aware of how here we are really looking at two different sensations and two different mediums and trying to translate them to the written word. And I think in some ways we do end up mirroring the music side of things, especially as we build to this really tense, discordant kind of crescendo. And it really picks up the pace. We start in kind of this fuzziness, right? Because we are thrown right in and we're kind of going back to pick up pieces. And because of that, we do have some suspension of disbelief. We kind of have to take things at their face in some places, but at the same time, everything is so much deeper than the face because the face here lies, right? It's this idea of beauty. And so as our protagonist is kind of taken into this company, she is given like personalized supplements. She starts on this beauty regimen that they have given her. Everything seems incredibly tailored to her. She also in the midst of this becomes close to the owner's niece because the owner of the company is not the kind of wellness guru influencer type 
who had originally approached her in that kitchen. She had started the company Holistic, but it was bought out by a man named Victor. And through some happenstances and some coincidences, our protagonist is thrown in with the niece and nephew of this owner because she basically hooks up with the nephew and runs into Helen, the niece, while there, and then they run into each other again at Holistic and again and form a really deep friendship that is a little frenzied as well as everything in this book is a little hazy and frenzied. And I say our protagonist because the book is in first person and we are kind of going with the chaotic fever dream of it enough that for a long time I didn't even realize that we really hadn't gotten her name. And so much in like R.F. Kuang's Babel, we don't get our protagonist's name. We get later an Americanized name that has been forced upon her in a really passive aggressive exchange where they are basically holding her hours at work hostage. Hours she needs because her parents, the reason she dropped out of conservatory in the first place, are in a care facility. They had been in an accident after one of her last performances at conservatory and she has since found it very difficult to play. She has never been able to quite find that music again amidst the grief, especially because piano was the language she communicated with her parents in in many ways. And so she needs these hours and this money to take care of her parents. And at this point, she's kind of been sucked in. And there is a cultish dynamic to everything as well, of course. And so we see some brainwashing start to happen. And it's presented as this thing of, oh, our customers, I know it's annoying, but our customers really need an American name, basically. They're finding it hard to say. We've had some complaints, whether there were actually complaints or not. And so it really interrogates and in that way without ever calling it out, the language of white supremacy, the language that robs people of their culture. And we can also kind of recognize that mean girl doublespeak, especially in terms of the context of the setting. And then it gets even more insidious, slight spoiler alert, because our protagonist realizes that her physical appearance has been slowly shifting over the course of the book. And in this shifting, she is losing her Asian features. She is losing her physicality that ties her to her parents and to her heritage. And because of that relationship with her parents, because she had been taken from them for so long in terms of sacrificing to go to conservatory, and it's easy to think of that as a privilege, but it's also a sacrifice because she is being torn from everyone and everything she knows and being put in this much different place. And she has the solace of music, but that is really all she has. And her isolation throughout the course of this is really evident and explored. And that is too part of what leads to that really intense friendship that she develops with Helen, because it's this kind of need in her to be seen, even if she is not being seen because she is changing. And so it's this idea of what this company, what the world desires of her. And we start to kind of unravel and unpack all of these really dangerous nuanced layers to this really sterile environment. We start to see the real dirt underneath. And not just in the farm, off in the countryside, the gunks where they source a lot of things. And there is a lot unanswered about that place. And so we are kind of in this narrative where nothing really feels real or tangible. We're able to unpack some of this societal critique. But like I said, we do have this real feverish quality to the writing. And that's absolutely explained by the state of mind of our protagonist and the fact that we are in the first person, which is part of the reason that that revelation of the name took so long for me to click because we were in her head. And so because of that, we're limited to what she's seeing, what she knows. But then we also have to remember that basically from the beginning of the book, she is on these supplements and we do not know what is in these supplements. She does not know what is in these supplements. And this brings down the level of inhibition for her in some ways, I believe, as a reader. But it also makes everything a little bit less Less cohesive and connected purposefully. Now granted she does not have all the pieces to connect anyway, but we kind of have to take some things for granted. Now some of this could have used a little bit more development. I think the whole world of Holistic in itself, the kind of whole world of our protagonist's friendship with Helen, a lot of this felt very surface level, but there was this tenor underneath everything that was very vibrant and dangerous and urgent, and it kept everything 
pushing forward, especially toward the end, where we did reach this real anxiety point of everything. About 20 pages, 30 pages from the end, I actually had to set the book down for a second and just take a deep breath. And it's only like 251 pages. And that's part of how everything moves so quickly. So yes, some things do definitely slip through the cracks, especially because we do have some really important discussions and explorations and also trigger warnings for those things that are being explored because we do have explorations of sexual assault and grooming. And I think it is important within the context of the book because we are looking at the way that women's bodies, specifically women of color's bodies, are co-opted and informed consent is taken from them and they are used. And also we are looking at the way we are sold to through wellness culture and beauty culture in many ways. And so there are really deep explorations there, really important explorations there, but because everything is so kind of fluid and fast paced, we don't really sit with them very much. But if that is something that could upset you, I definitely think that this may be one you wanna sit back from because it is very kind of thrown in. You are forced to kind of sit with that and it's not necessarily resolved. You're just left with that kind of icky feeling. And I admittedly struggled with that as a reader at first. I was like, oh, we need to unpack that more. We need to sit with that more. There are a lot of really awful things happening and they just kind of keep coming and they build in this really kind of deceptively steady way as these things usually do, right? And that is part of what it is exploring as our character is pulled into this world. There are these little glimpses at first, red flags, if you will, where you might say, oh, that's definitely a red flag, but in the moment would you recognize it this way? And it is obviously also a really heightened exploration of these issues, or at least I hope it is a really heightened exploration of these issues. So we are getting peaks to these real horrors. It really moves in to horror, but we're not really getting explanations of what is going on. We're like getting flashes of the horrific, like in a haunted house with the strobe lights and then moving on. And that can be hard too, because I want to understand the internal logic of this company, what exactly is going on, but our protagonist doesn't know. And as a reader, it is almost more interesting for the tone of this novel that is being established that we also don't know. And so that is where the suspension of disbelief comes in because we just kind of have to go with it. We just kind of have to go with these personalized supplements. We just kind of have to go with the technology we're seeing. And then we just kind of have to go with the experimentation as it becomes more evident and this kind of real body horror that really starts to develop. And I think that the idea of body horror in conversation with beauty, wellness culture, this obsession with looks is so interesting, especially because it is clear almost from the beginning that is really the conversation we're having here. We see Victor early on, or when we learn that Victor is the head of this company, we see him and we see him through our protagonist's eyes and he is described immediately as almost like the flesh on his face being kind of soft. And it's something about the description, but it gives this idea that he has been through so many procedures and so many like graphs that it almost looks like there is a like soft mask on top of his skin and on his face. And so we get this idea of kind of like twisted beauty and this idea, almost like that Dorian Gray idea, right? Of how perfect you look on the outside and how twisted you are on the inside, but where is the portrait? And it's not correlating beauty with evil, but it is exploring the way that people can be exploited for their insecurities and also that the way that beauty can be co-opted and the way that people can become just bodies or vessels especially for those who can afford to meet the beauty standard, whatever that is, and how they are sold their insecurities. It talks about kind of that sales technique of always be selling someone the version of themselves like two steps down the road so that they continue to buy new products. We see so many new kind of like obscure and ridiculous products launch in the course of the novel and they kind of heighten in the level of ridiculousness, but we still get the idea of the tenor and fervor of people desiring these products. And we've seen somewhat ridiculous products 
be desired by people and sell out. I mean, I made my comparisons right off the bat, so you know where I stand on that. But like I said, it really is exploring the price of beauty and who is paying that cost. And then kind of juxtaposing, like I said, the idea of physical beauty, beauty physically kind of manifested in people rather than visual art, and music and the way that they can be in conversation with each other, but also it then kind of weaves in ideas of class and classism there because it's looking at who has access to the arts and ability to kind of be cultivators of art and what it means to be fans of certain art, what it says about you. Our protagonist is told right off the bat that she should mention her piano playing because it makes her more cultured, it makes her more desirable for their customers. And the fact that it is framed through the customers, it's this kind of aspirational elitist thing. But at the same time, we are seeing music through our protagonist's eyes as this incredibly personal expression, this way to kind of work out feelings and this great connector with herself and her family and her identity. And so I think it would also be remiss to talk about this book without also acknowledging the conversations it's having about assimilation and white beauty standards, especially in America, and how colonialism has kind of expedited that across the world, and just how we have such a limited idea of a beauty standard and how warped the cycle has become in terms of beauty cycles moving much quicker becoming more extreme. It really made me think when I was in high school, the dystopian, the first dystopian I read was Uglies. And it's still my favorite. I haven't reread it for a long time. But I really enjoyed that book. And I don't really generally enjoy dystopias. But the idea of uglies. The idea of M.T. Anderson's feed felt so dystopian, so extreme, so remote and far off. And this book is kind of looking at that through a different lens and exploring how present, how close all of that really is now. And so it is like I said, we get these little snippets. We're not made aware of the complete picture. It's odd, it's weird, it's horrific. The tone of things is really separated from the beauty the novel is exploring. Like the writing is beautiful, but it's also meant to be discordant. It's supposed to be a little staccato. It's supposed to, and granted, again, this is all by interpretation, but jar us a little as readers. It's when our protagonist is talking about those discordant notes, the pain that really elevates beauty in music, I think a similar approach is being taken here in its examination of beauty culture in the writing. We are exploring this through a lens of horror and extremism and like oddity, but it is really getting down to this idea of beauty and we are being told that people are beautiful, but we are so removed from those aesthetics as readers that we are able to experience it on a different level. Like, would we be more influenced by certain people and characters? Obviously, if it was like translated on screen, there would be lighting choices, costume choices, music choices in particular that could kind of guide us as viewers. But how is the narrative guiding us in that? And how would that be different if we were just in this experience. And obviously it gets really extreme. And obviously there are extreme parts, like I said from the beginning, but what is the kind of line where us as a person dropped into this world would start to be like, oh, something's going on here. And something that I've really been struggling with the last couple of years is that it used to be so easy to say, oh, we would recognize that right away. And it's not anymore. We have seen so much kind of manipulation through so many different mediums and we've realized how easy it is to kind of warp perception through social media, I think. And again, while this book doesn't really fully get into that, and I'm not exactly sure why, it might be to avoid dating it a little bit because even while there are things that feel like very pertinent references in the now, I think it is also so disconnected and removed and living so much in that fever dream of everything that like a decade down the line, it will still read that way removed of those extra connectors. Like will people still be able to say, oh, that feels very goop coded. That feels very, I don't know, glossier coded. I'm not saying glossier in particular is at this level, but it does tie back to this idea of natural beauty, like the title, because it is so much artificial beauty in the book. But this idea 
that we can present naturally or that we can change what is natural. And so in that way, it really does get at the heart of horror because it is exploring that tension between nature and science and human limitation and also interrogating colonialism because as has been mentioned, at least to my experience, so much of horror really comes with the exploration of that loss of control. And I think that that is so inextricably linked. So yeah, as usual, this is almost deceptively simple. It reads smoothly, even as it feels like we're always kind of fighting against this current of questions, but that is what kind of keeps us off kilter as readers, allows us to kind of be on guard, know something is up, but we're never going to get full answers. There's so much that just doesn't really fully flesh out here. And again, I think that's incredibly purposeful. So how successful that is really depends on your interpretation, I would say. But I think that this book really wants us to sit in those questions and really wants us to sit in that discomfort and interrogate the whole kind of system and where we sit amidst it. And when we start to peel back these extreme layers, what are we left with? What's our reality? And is it too close to the extreme for our comfort or not? There's just a lot that this novel wants you to sit with. But if you like horror that really delves into cultural critique, if you like body horror, if you like really weird extreme things, if you like explorations of beauty culture, of informed consent, things of that nature, I would really encourage you to pick this up. Like I said at the beginning, if maybe you have read this and enjoyed it and haven't read Lakewood by Megan Giddings, also be sure to pick that one up. Lakewood isn't really exploring beauty culture necessarily, but it's exploring a lot of similar things, especially in relation to informed consent from a different angle and has a similar kind of tone and kind of mental place I felt in as a reader while reading. So I'm definitely interested to hear what you're thinking. As usual, thanks for hanging out and listening to my thoughts, especially as I was unpacking a lot of them here. Like, subscribe, comment, whatever, as you feel led. We are getting really close to a thousand, which I didn't really ever conceive of. So any engagement is of course appreciated, but never expected. Just thanks for being here. Read something good, most importantly, and yeah, bye.